Folks, welcome back inside the Parisi Palace, high above 2919 East Broadway. This is a special edition of the Jake Feinberg Show. Coming to you live on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live. Download, download our app and stream all of our live local shows, including the Jake Feinberg Show. We are full-on extraterrestrial radio, adapting to the new realities of a new world. And we thank you for being part of the program today. And without further ado, I want to bring in a, a woman who has been a prolific artist and contributor to our cultural heritage over the last 40 years. She continues to do it and also um, had a uh, some collaboration with uh, a guy I'm doing a documentary on, Stan Getz. Melissa Manchester, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. You know, I just wanted to ask you to start, if you could talk about, we're just living through a very callous, in my mind, a very callous time right now, and I just... I wanted you to talk about um, your concept of love and uh, and how you bring love to your world. Wow, what an opening question. <laughs> um, I think uh, the way I try to do it through my songs, which are my vehicle, is to um, is to try to help people believe in themselves and uh, to try to create light. Because I think when you can shine light and help people to feel their own light, then they can see where there have been shadows, where there is darkness, where there's stuff to work on, where lessons have been learned, where recognition of accomplishments shows up. Um, And I think that is a loving thing for me to do and what I hope I do. Uh, Could you give a specific example when that actually happened? Oh, my goodness. Um, Lots of examples. Over the years, um, I have received many letters. This was before there were emails and stuff. And since then, many emails about people who have listened to my music and um, decided not to commit suicide, um, decided to make a baby because of a song that I'd written used a song that I'd written to serenade them down a wedding aisle, help them get through a, a, an army stint or a jail term. Um, so I believe that that's extremely powerful and was not my intention, but when it was reflected back to me that way as helping people on that profound level over and over again, I was uh, extremely grateful and profoundly touched. That's absolutely beautiful. You've really passed that test with flying colors. I, I mean, have you, have you, your, can you t- yourself talk about, um, because in some ways that's inspirational for you to hear that and then to ke- continue to collab, to keep going and to move forward and, and not stagnate. But could you talk to the audience a little bit about a time in your life when you were fighting adversity and how you overcame it? Well, the, the art, artistic path is not an easy one because um, you have to keep, keep digging deeper to, to, hold on to, your, to hold on to your artistic hunger. And so, um, yes, I, I, I went through personal very dark times, and, um, and I am a, a, a praying woman. And so um, I know that all I'm promised is strength. Uh, not an easy path, nothing else but strength to get through. And as long as I can hold on to my personal version of faith and my personal connection to my, to my God, then um, I know that my ego, my small fear-based thinking, can be moved aside, and my faith helps me find a path where there are answers. Talking to Melissa Manchester here on the Jake Feinberg Show live on Power Talk. Um, was there, did this take, uh, because it, it's you articulated very well, and I, it sounds very earnest, did it take a long time for you to, um, I don't know what the right word is, manage this fear-based ego, or uh, was there a defining, a demarcation point when you can say that it finally locked in that you knew that through prayer and faith, that you would, um, that you would, that salvation would be there. Well, you know, these are 
fant- first of all, these are fantastic questions that you're that you're asking. Thank you for that. I love these conversations. Yeah, no, well, that's what my show's all about. I'm not sure if you looked at my website. Yeah, I mean, that's, I, it, I'm not it. a musician, so I talk about this. Yeah, stuff. yeah. Um, you know, time is a funny thing. Um, we humans have a very urgent sense of time, but once I realize that there's my time and that there's God's time. Um, I really, I surrender, and surrendering to me is so magnificent, because um, for me, um, I have learned that surrendering is an ongoing process, and it's really on the on the DNA level, it's on the cellular level where um, you keep surrendering your sense of fear and your sense of limited thinking. That's the thing, and once I keep, once I really locked into that spiritual muscle of continual surrendering, particularly in the darkest times of my life. Um, I just, I just let whatever, you know, emotional knot was triggering me. Um, I just let my thinking go because when I'm anxious, my thinking becomes obsessive and circular and crazy and not solution oriented and once I learned about surrendering um, I just had faith that an answer would come and in terms of a timeline it comes when it comes and if you have faith that it'll come then you just go about your business and one day you take notice of your mind and you realize that you're not quite as anxious as you was two days ago as you were two days ago and um, and that's sort of how spiritual time works um do you find that this is a continual, continual ongoing process? I mean, you have not reached the top of the mountain yet. It is a continual process, yes, indeed. And and so um, while while I've achieved some lovely moments in my life and survived some very dark moments in my life, um, w- what is really interesting about the 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 trajectory of my life is. And I don't mean to be glib, but glib I am, <laughs> is that in my in my early in the early decades of my life, it was amazing how much I accomplished while I was unconscious. <laughs> and now that I've achieved, uh, you know, with age, uh, and hopefully gained wisdom, a real sense of consciousness, it's fantastic to have things integrated into my emotional maturity and. Um, and so my my appreciation for things is just greater and greater all the time, including the hard the hard parts. Right. It's about overcoming the. I mean, did you? How? Also, the question is. I mean, I have this. Uh, you know, your albums. You know, I'm 38 years old. I uh, and I go through these uh, thrift stores here in Tucson, and I mean, your records are everywhere and from every yeah. de- every decade and. Uh, <laughs> And I'm dear friends with cats that played on your albums, guys like Alan Schwartzberg and these guys. Are just, uh, you know, I mean, these are these are the the salt of the earth cats. I mean, you, you hear that word are. thrown around, but it, it the, the, yep. you know, and and I just wonder if you have advice for <clears throat> younger women, especially. I mean, I've actually dedicated my show this year to the year of the woman, and um, I've interviewed Rita Coolidge, and I've interviewed uh, Lanny Lanny Hall, and. Um, I've interviewed a bunch of women, but I wanted you to talk about, you know, just for younger people out there who are thrust into the spotlight, um, how to manage um, success and adversity, uh, because we are speeding up. Uh, This human time element that you talk about is very real versus the spiritual time element. And that that stuff doesn't really compute when you're a teenager or when you're young. So, I mean, can you can you can you can you lend some wisdom to cats that are you know, that, that catch a break, um, that get hot, and how to deal with with the high highs and the low lows? Um, well, um, I have learned from my teaching. I'm an adjunct professor at the University of Southern California at the Thornton School, and I do master classes all over the country. And it's really interesting because um, young artists are, on the whole, much more educated it still doesn't mean that they won't sign a stupid contract. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> because That's right. Right. because the the creative hunger and the emotional hunger to be loved, to be liked, and to get on your way is so profound. And what I try to teach my young charges is 
if possible, breathe deeply and try to slow your brain down as much as possible. And there are different tricks to do that because you have to remember that you will be tricked uh, consciously or unconsciously by managers and agents and lawyers and publishers who want you to sign things and will try to sell you on that what you're about to sign is the greatest deal of your lifetime and that you're lucky to have the deal. But, but the truth is, and it's very hard to wrap your brain around this when you're very young, they're all making money off of you and your art and your soul. It's very, very hard to accept that kind of power and ownership when you're, you know, when you're barely in your 20s. But that's just the truth. And so if you can, and, and they leverage your lack of experience with, with their huge experience. And so it behooves young musicians to really get as informed as possible and ask older musicians and ask teachers and friendly lawyers and, and spiritual advisors how to hold on to your center and as far as being a performer, when things are really hot for you, you know, the main thing that you have to hold on to your center as a performer is um, particularly when you're exhausted and you have to keep going, you know, your, your responsibility is to keep your performance and your message fresh for the audience over and over and over and over. And you have to find a way to present it as if you sung it for the first time. Um, every time, um, because you just never know who you're going to touch. You never know whose life you're going to save. You never know whose mind is going to be clarified by your work. And it's it's such a profound gift. And you know you don't you don't really get that when you're first going out. Um, uh, so it, it's all of it's all of the above and more, but but it's the only you know as an artist it's the only path where you make a living from your life, um, and so you have to be very careful with how you dole out your energy and your time. Now, Melissa Manchester, waxing poetic here on the Jake Feinberg show. Um, wh- when did you first? Um, uh, when did you first find out about Stan Getz? Well, I grew up with the magnificent sound of Stan Getz and Paul Desmond uh, and uh, Dave Brubeck. Uh, you know, it it, uh, it broke all kinds of boundaries in terms of jazz crossover into the popular music radio stream. And uh, so Stan Getz was, was a sound of my, you know, part of my musical landscape. Can you talk specifically about, uh, you know, I'm just curious, you're, you're, I mean, I'm sort of, your professional career really started to cook in the early 70s, but, um, mm-hmm. you know, were you, can you talk about him, like, dislodging John Lennon and the Beatles from the pop charts? I mean, he was one of these rare cats who yeah. who, who had, who, who, who was able to cross over playing improvisational right. music. Yeah, yeah, no, he was magnificent. He was the first person that I heard that had that, remarkably smoky aura about his sound. It was just fantastic. It was so evocative. And then I had the great honor of working with him in a concert for the Boston Pops, which was televised, you know. And um, I had just recorded my tribute album, which was my tribute to several of the great women singers that had meant the world to me growing up. And magnificent Peter Matz, co-produced it and did all of the arrangements and he was one of the giants that I was so honored to to work with and when when I did the pop uh, concert and Stan Getz was going to play with me uh, we did um, Body and Soul and um, there was a phrase at the end of my arrangement on my recording that I had asked um stand to to repeat and he was none too pleased <laughs> uh, you know what 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 happened was that the at the end of the song uh, we were referencing uh, the musical phrase 
from the song, but not for me. They're writing songs of love, but not for me. It's a beautiful melodic line, and it seemed to finish off my arrangement beautifully. And when I asked Stan if he would, you know, do me the favor of, of you know, playing that, of recreating that, he looked at me and he said, adorable. I thought, oh, man, this is, this is not a pleasant moment, and there's a crack in my esteem for this fellow musician. But when it came time to, to do it and we were taped, um, he indeed made that musical reference, and I looked at him and he looked at me, and there was, you know, there was a pleasant acknowledgement. But <laughs> it was a little dicey there for a minute. Was he, I mean, can you break that down? Because I, I literally just got off the phone with Seymour Red Press, who's a Broadway contractor, but he knew Stan when they were 13 years old. And, I mean, wow. you know, I mean, we're really talking about somebody uh, who was uh, emotionally unevolved in many ways. Um, I mean, I'm glad that I've got somebody. Who's well, I mean, I, I mean, it's very hard. I mean, I want, I, I, I believe that. Uh, I think he was very, very kind. People like Johnny Mandel, who talk about him, just you know, always treating him like just, just gold. But of course, it's always with the caveat. But I know the stories. I mean, can you explain from a musician's point of view why he was um, perturbed by your request? You know, I, I can only guess. Um, what I have learned is that just because you're talented, that is not a barometer of niceness or character or anything. It's just a chemical imbalance that makes us talented. You know, it could have been a twitch, but it turns out to be to elevate some component in the brain chemistry, and we end up being gifted musicians. But that's it, right? Talent is just talent. And I don't know any of Stan's backstory i would imagine as a as a fellow musician he may have been missed at my request to recreate something that's already been that had been recorded as opposed to giving him leeway to just you know improvise his own ending um but for me when i'm performing i'm telling a monologue with music and so if the final uh, ending of the part, ending of the composition, has a has a final musical postscript, which was what my idea was. Then that finishes the musical scene for me, the musicalized scene for me. And I think he was, you know, I think that's really what it was. I think he was miffed to be asked to recreate something as opposed to give him the leeway to be stand guest and to improvise something. But oh well. Yeah, no, I mean it's it's interesting. I mean, the, how who? I mean, you were you said you were dedicating the, these these concerts to women singers. How did um, how did you and Stan wind? Who connected you guys originally? No, it wasn't concerts to women singers. It was an album called Tribute, sure. and it was dedicated to all of these women singers. And so I so I was singing songs that they had made famous. I had given them given it as. as as well as Peter Mass's uh, arrangements, my own interpretations. How did we get connected? Well, you know, that, that had to do with the casting of the Boston Pop series. And, um, and I was honored to, to be on the stage with him because, he, you know, his sound and his artistry was, was just glorious. And I was thrilled that he would play on a piece of mine. Did you, um, in, the, in the annals, do you remember, like, specifically... Uh you know, uh, which to, like, did you get to see him live perform when you were, I don't know if you were in New York, California in the early seventies, but did you have a chance to see him live play before you actually collaborated with him? No, no, unfortunately I've never seen him live. Um, I, I only heard him all the time on the radio and on records and then, you know, being able to share the stage with him was a thrill. Melissa, can you talk to me a little bit about, um, in your mind, uh, leadership, uh, your, your concept of leadership? And, uh, you know, because I think that we live in a time now where there's a lot of, um, we are driven in a lot of ways by uh, a lot of the almighty dollar, uh, what gets ratings. Uh, we, we are a reactive society, but then when people make statements, we, we, we question why everybody's so reactive to it. Um, 
I just was hoping you could talk about your concept of leadership and how that has sustained you. Well, leadership is an interesting, it's an interesting concept. Um, to lead, I suppose, means to be in charge and to help solutions be found for, for larger problems that are affecting those whom you are leading. Um, I know personally it took me a long time to understand my leadership position. Um, I'm, I'm very appreciative that my band has been together uh, for me for over 30 years. We don't play all that often together, but when I call them up, they're around. And my tour manager has been with me for 34 years. Um, but when I first started out, I just thought I was doing an extension of what I did in my mother's living room, which is the thing. It took me a very long time to understand that I had a responsibility to create an energy that people would feel comfortable and emotionally safe in. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's part of what is so frustrating in our nation, um, which is a Congress in, in turmoil and a Senate in turmoil, you know, the, the lack of bipartisanship to get things done, people not acquiescing and, and not having the spirit of compromise, it's, it's so frustrating because they are, they are the last to really know, even though they know full well, they are the last to acknowledge how people are suffering and need their leadership to help solve very real problems. So, um, I think that, you know, and it doesn't rest just with the president uh, or whomever, you know, will be in that office. It, 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 the government is made up of so many people, and, um, and they are all representatives of, of millions. And um, I don't think, you know, as Ronald Reagan was talking about trickle-down economics, I think it's trickle up from the grassroots. Congressmen and representatives and senators and the president have to be mindful of. So, I think anyway, you're, I don't no, know. No, I mean, I think I just was there a, a demarcation point in your career? We t you were very eloquent about talking about uh, realizing that you needed to create a, a comfortable emotional space for the audience. Um, did that dawn on you on the bandstand, or was that something that you that maybe one of your confidants came to you and said, you know, or I mean, how did that? How did that evolve? Um, I know I'm, di I'm, I'm, I'm you're digging, you got to dig deep on these things, I know. Yes, no, this is, this is fantastic. Yeah. Um, you know, the truth is, I, I'm not a member of the band. This is, this is, what I do is my name and my work, and it's supported by a band. What I know to be true is that musicians play for each other they don't really play for the audience and when i would have to help them see that they can't just be turning to other band members to to play to that they actually need to to look at the audience and when i'm seeing quietly they need to look at me at, so that they can hold the focus and the audience can hold the focus as well um, that that was slightly in the in the early years that was slightly uncomfortable because I presumed that people just sort of got that, but but side men you know don't do what I do, and I don't do what they do, and I I gently learned how to assert myself, and also learned how to be assertive without being aggressive, so that so that I could make sure that people heard me. That was one of the hardest things for me to. To realize was my issue was the, the frustration with not being heard or my perception of not being heard and right. that had to do with signing with a big successful record company I had a great big engine behind me which was fantastic but the trade-off was that you know the record company president had very serious suggestions that sometimes made me bristle and sometimes amazed me and were in line with my thoughts, and it was all just difficult, you know, in, in many cases. I, you know, I had great successes and, and astounding failures, 
And um, but the the hardest thing in talking with corporate people was the frustration with being heard. And uh, and it took me a very long time for me to realize that they had a business to run. And their business was based on my artistic output. And um, and because I had been at this for so long and the nature of the industry was changing, particularly in the early 80s when electronics started to be these luscious toys that producers could play with, it really put my, my voice and my songwriting to the side. And I started to find myself competing for space on my own albums with my own songs that, you know, that they that the record company president didn't feel was good enough or appropriate enough or whatever, or in accord with the times. And that was very, very frustrating. So to be heard um, as, a, as a human being, uh, as a woman, I suppose, uh, as an artist for sure, is very serious business. And in the early years, you know, your immaturity just makes you stamp your foot and scream louder and 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 cry and threaten and just be terribly, terribly frustrated because in the early years I didn't really have emotional tools. I I just was completely reactive. And it took me it took me decades and I don't know what the mysterious demarcation line was. It's just that at some point I just wasn't reacting any longer. I just Something in me shifted. I don't know if it was raising my children. I don't know if it was getting out of a troubled marriage. I don't know what it was. I just sort of knew myself on a deeper level. And I had learned from from reading, from listening, from deeply hearing people I admired, how they responded as opposed to reacted to difficult situations or difficult people, and to hold my center while somebody was trying to tell me that the sky was purple and not blue. <laughs> and, um, and you know, the truth is, I know what I know now. And on this 20th album of mine that was released last year called You Gotta Love the Life, that title came out of a discussion I had with my daughter about the artistic path, because it's so, it's such a, a, a um, in, a, interesting tangled version of normal but it appeals to me and that's what appeals to many artists who can sustain the walk but it sure is not for everybody but at some point at some point even with the tangles of that version of normal there's such extraordinary joy uh, and it's not even a high anymore it's just a deepening of 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 uh, a spiritual joy so so that's so what I'm saying is there was some kind of a shift in me. Uh, there's another song on the You Gotta Love the Life album called I Know Who I Am. I couldn't have written that a second prior to me writing that with Joanna uh, Cotton and Greg Barnhill. That is, that is a testimony of what I know to be true. And people keep trying to talk you out of what you know to be true, but as you get older, you listen to them politely, and you dismiss them and bless them and send them on their way because you just <laughs> simply know what your truth is. Hmm. Well, this is very vital, very vital stuff. Did were you like? Can you talk about the most uh, surprising thing uh, working with Stan? I mean, I know he he was not somebody who liked to rehearse a lot <laughs> at all. Correct. Uh, can you can yeah. you can you talk like? Did you do much rehearsing at all? Well, we had to rehearse because we were at the Boston Symphony. And so, yes, he was on the stage with me. And, um, you know, he starts to play, and it's that sound. It's that sound. And you can't believe you're standing next to that person that created that sound that is just imprinted so deeply on your heart. And then he opens up his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> And there, you know, and there you have it. You know, there there is the the delineation between the magnificent artistry and the human being behind it. And um, and you're grateful for the artistry, even even though, you know, we we had a bit of a, a weird moment. Um, still, in all, 
he showed up and he was magnificent and that sound was magnificent and even though the story you know that i'm left with is kind of odd and silly you know i'm still honored that i shared the stage with him oh absolutely i mean can you talk about that concept the old school improvisatory concept of that stan had i'm not sure if you talked to your students about it but it just it's it's totally from the old school in the sense that you know with Stan he was he was on the road with Tea Garden in ninth grade was not academically brought up musically at all. Um, if he didn't he had big ears but if he didn't hear it and he didn't feel it he wasn't going to play and he was going to let the rhythm section come in and coalesce and either end it or continue uh, a new new vocabulary and that really was part of the old school and I wanted you to talk about how that not necessarily in that performance because that was in the late 80s but I'm just talking about in general the idea of old school improvisation and I just wanted you to riff on that for a minute as best I can you know I'm not I'm not a a jazz performer and I'm not a jazz musician Um, the, the thing that I can appreciate however is that they they have such magnificent melodies to to improvise on um, and when, you know, when they would take a composition that was perhaps, you know, from the stages of Broadway, for instance, like my favorite things or whatever, sure. um, from Sound of Music, you know, that, that is an extraordinary composition by Richard Rogers. They played the ink, even though the rhythm may have been, you know, whatever their interpretation is, and it was always glorious. But they, they 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 committed themselves to the ink and played the melody and then they went off and then they took turns and then they found absolutely new musical vocabulary upon which to keep developing those melodic ideas and then they all ended up at the same point which was just brilliant. Um, I don't know what's old school about that or new school about that. The only thing that's old school about that, I guess, are the melodies which were written such a long time ago now. But um, It was just the idea, it was really the idea of where you see a lot of times today um, cats getting up and and showing huge technical chops, but just blowing for the sake of blowing, and in a sense... Well, that is, you know, that that is an interesting point, too, and I appreciate that you're bringing that up. That is also true, in my opinion, about theater writing as well. You go, uh, go off on that. Talk about I, that. I am, I am, yeah, I am addicted to writing theater. <laughs> and oh, I don't, awesome. don't get a chance to as much, but but I love, uh, and I have written, I just wrote my second musical, which was produced in Houston, called The Sweet Potato Queens. But I had an off-Broadway musical called I Sent a Letter to My Love many years ago, and I've written several projects for Disney, um, in particular uh, Lady and the Tramp 2 and The Great Mouse Detective. I've written songs for Disney. The thing is, is that, you know, the technical proficiency has bleached into musical theater as well as jazz. And for my money, people write stuff simply because they can, not because they are so beautifully servicing the characters that they're writing for, giving them musical motifs. You know, I'm I'm a huge song person. I believe in the value of of a song. I believe in the value of what a song creates and synthesizes for the listener. Uh, It clarifies mush in in the brain of the listener and helps them synthesize floating anxiety and gives them voice. And when somebody comes backstage and says, I had no idea that anybody else felt the way I did or was going through what I was going through, thank you for writing that song and singing that song. It felt like you were singing it to me. Well, in that same way, when when Stan Getz, you know, could riff on a solid melody and then just break out and make it his own, it started with the solid melody. And... A lot of what I am hearing these days, because of the influx of top line writing, I'm not sure if you know what that is. No, but but uh, no, I don't even know. It doesn't. I don't know what that means at all. Top line writing means that a writer, a songwriter, is given a track. 
just a track, a rhythm track with chords. That's it. And you end up writing the lyrics and the melody. Now, in my day, that track would have been called an arrangement. That would not have been called writing. <laughs> right, right, right. And so, so the reversal of positions is so weird uh, for me. I mean, you know, I've done it and I can do it, but it's, you know, for me, the most fulfilling writing is sitting in a room with somebody and either talking about a character if we're writing for a theatrical piece or if, if we're writing a song for, you know, for an album or somebody else's album, you know, to, to have the music and the lyrics come out of a conversation so that the song actually sounds conversational, which means that it will instantly resonate with somebody on a very deep level. Um, that's what I think is a really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm with you. I, I, I'm with you, honestly. I think there's a lot of people writing stuff because they think they, because they can. And, um, you know, it just sort of, it's, it, it's just sort of interesting and of the moment. And, uh, you know, it makes me wonder what people will, will be moved to ha lead a better life because of that. There, I just watched this really interesting documentary called Take Me to the River about the, these incredible Memphis musicians, you know, from the 1920s sure. on. And they were being paired with some recent rap people who were just, you know, doing a rap section in the middle of recreating the original composition. Uh, you know, and, <laughs> you know, and the older guys were just sort of making room for it. And I'm sitting in my bedroom watching this and just scratching my head going, okay, what? <laughs> so, I don't know. No, I, I mean, no, I, I mean, I think you really were very articulate about. It. I mean, there's there's something there about, uh, you know, I think it just speaks to also to um, the lack of authenticity too. I mean, just the idea that um, you know, uh, real people had to get into the studio. Just when the, I mean, you came you came up at a time when when the studio scenes were thriving. People, I've interviewed yep. all the studio cats. I've interviewed luminaries as well, but. You know, even the luminaries understood they'd be nowhere without the studio cats. And likewise, the studio cats, right. you know, I mean, they'd come in before the sun came up and they'd leave when the sun went down. They wouldn't even That's see exactly. it. So, I mean, it, right. it, it was it, it made more sense. And I think um, we are living through a very disjointed time. You talked about it in our political uh, just our just the, you know, and how things move and how things work. And and you if you listen to some certain outlets, you would think that everything is absolutely falling apart when in fact maybe it's just not working the way those people want it to work so therefore it in their 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 world's falling apart but they project yeah. it out into the whole uh zeitgeist i mean that you know listen i mean melissa i really would love to, i didn't expect to uh to open it up like this um uh but i really hope that we can uh do this again sometime i i, I really had a ball talking to you and uh you. And uh, it was it was great. Also, I, I friended you on Facebook, so that m I disseminate most of these stories on Facebook. So a lot of your a lot of the a lot of your of your of your poetry is going to go up there. So definitely friend me on Facebook. Great, thank right. you very much. This has been fantastic. I've so enjoyed this discussion. Well, it was a blast. We'll do it again soon. All right. Great. Thank all right. You, Jake. Talk to you soon.